Chapter 7. The Baby Austin Inside the caravan, I stood on a chair and lit the oil lamp in the ceiling. I had some weekend homework to do, and this was it, as good a time as any to do it. I laid my books out on the table and sat down, but I found it impossible to keep my mind on my work. The clock said half past seven. This was the twilight time. He would be there now. I pictured him, in his old navy blue sweater and peaked cap, walking soft-footed up the track towards the school, or towards the wood. He told me he wore the sweater because navy blue hardly showed up at all in the dark. Black was even better, he said, but he didn't have a black one, and navy blue was the next best. The peaked cap was important, too, he explained, because the peak cast a shadow over one's face. Just about now, he would be wriggling through the hedge and entering the wood. Inside the wood, I could see him treading carefully over the leafy ground, stopping, listening, going on again, and all the time searching and searching for the keeper who would somewhere be standing still as a post, being a big tree with a gun under his arm. Keepers hardly move at all when they are in a wood watching for poachers, he had told me. They stand dead still at night, still right up against the trunk of a tree, and it's not easy to spot a motionless man in that position at twilight when the shadows are as dark as a wolf's mouth. I closed my books. It was no good trying to work. I decided to go to bed instead. I undressed and put on my pajamas and climbed into my bunk. I left the lamp burning. Soon I fell asleep. When I opened my eyes again, the oil lamp was still glowing, and the clock on the wall said ten minutes past two. Ten minutes past two! I jumped out of my bunk and looked into the bunk above mine. It was empty. He had promised he would be home by 10.30 at the latest, and he never broke promises. He was nearly four hours overdue. At that moment, a frightful sense of doom came over me. Something really bad Hap something really hap had happened to him this time. I felt quite certain of it. Hold it, I told myself. Don't get panicky. Last week, you all got panicky, and you made a bit of a fool of yourself. Yes, but last week was a different thing altogether. He had made no promises to me last week. This time, he had said, I promise I'll be back by 1030. Those were his exact words, and he never, absolutely never broke a promise. I looked again at the, cl at the clock. He had left the caravan at six, which meant he had been gone over eight hours. It took me two seconds to decide what I should do. Very quickly, I stripped off my pajamas and put on my shirt and my jeans. Perhaps the keepers had shot him up so badly he couldn't walk. I pulled my sweater over my head. It was neither navy blue nor black. It was a sort of pale brown. It would have to do. Perhaps he was lying in the wood bleeding to death. My sneakers were the wrong color too. They were white, but they were also dirty and that took a lot of the whiteness away. How long would it take to get to the wood? An hour and a half. Less if I ran most of the way, but not much less. As I bent down to tie the laces, I noticed my hands were shaking and my stomach had that awful prickly feeling as though it were full of small needles. I ran down the steps of the caravan and across to the workshop to get the torch. A torch is a good companion when you are all alone outdoors at night, and I wanted it with me. I grabbed the torch and went out of the workshop. I paused for a moment beside the pump. The moon had long since disappeared, but the sky was clear, and a great mass of stars were, was wheeling above my head. There was no wind at all, no sound of any kind. To my right, Going away into the blackness of the countryside lay the lonely road that led to the dangerous wood, six and a half miles. Thank heavens I knew the way, but it was going to be a long, hard slog. I must try to keep a steady, a good steady pace and not run myself to a standstill in the first mile. At that point, a wild and marvelous idea came to me. Why shouldn't I go into the, go in the baby Austin? I really did know how to drive. My father had always allowed me to move the cars around when they came in for repair. He let me drive them in the into the workshop and back then, back them out after again, <clears throat> back them out again afterwards.
and sometimes I drove one of them slowly around the pumps in first gear. I loved doing it, and I would get there much quicker if I went by car. This was an emergency. If he was wounded and bleeding badly, then every minute counted. I had never driven on the road, but I would surely not meet any other cars at this time of night. I would go very slowly and keep close into the hedge on the proper side. I went back to the workshop and switched on the light. I opened the double doors. I got into the driver's seat of the baby Austin. I turned on the ignition key. I pulled out the, the choke. I found the starter button and pressed it. The motor coughed once, then started. Now for the lights. There was a pointed switch on the dashboard and I turned it on and turned it to the S for side lights only. The side lights came on. I felt for the clutch pedal in my toe, with my toe. I was just able to reach it, but I had to point my toe if I wanted to press it all the way down. I pressed it down. Then I slipped out I slipped the gear lever into reverse. Slowly I backed the car out of the workshop. I left her ticking over and went back to switch off the workshop light. It was better to keep everything looking as normal as possible. The filling station was in the darkness now, except for a dim light coming from the caravan where the little oil lamp was still burning. I decided to leave that on. I got back into the car and I closed the door. The side lights were so dim I hardly knew they were there. I switched on the headlamps. That was better. I searched for the dipper with my foot. I found it. I tried it and it worked. I put the headlamps on full. If I met another car, I must remember to dip them. Although actually, they weren't bright enough to dazzle a cockroach. They didn't give any more light than a couple of good torches. I pressed down the clutch pedal again and pushed the gear lever into first. This was it. My heart was thumping away so fiercely I could hear it in my throat. Ten yards away lay the main road. It was as dark as doomsday. I released the clutch very slowly. At the same time, I pressed down just a fraction of an inch on this accelerator with my right toe and stealthily, oh, most wonderfully, the little car began to lean forward and steal into motion. I pressed a shade harder on the accelerator. We crept out of the filling station onto the dark, deserted road. I will not pretend I wasn't petrified. I was, but mixed in with it, the awful fear was a glorious feeling of excitement. Most of the really exciting things we do in our lives scare us to death. They wouldn't be exciting if they didn't. I sat very stiff and upright in my seat, gripping the steering wheel tight with both hands. My eyes were about level with the top of the steering wheel. I could have done it. I couldn't have done with a cushion to raise me up higher, but it was too late for that. The road seemed awfully narrow in the dark. I knew there was room enough for two cars to pass each other. I had seen them from the filling station doing it a million times, but it didn't look that way to me from where I was. At any moment, something with blazing headlights might come roaring towards me at 60 miles an hour, a heavy lorry, or one of those big long distance buses that travel through the night full of passengers. Was I too much in the middle of the road? Yes, I was but I didn't want to pull in closer for fear of hitting the bank. If I hit the bank and bust the front axle, then all would be lost and I would never get my father home. The motor was beginning to rattle and shake. I was still in first gear. It was vital to change up into second, otherwise the engine would get too hot, would get hot too, would get too hot. I knew how the change was done, but I had never actually tried doing it. Around the filling station, I had always stayed in first gear. Well, here goes. I eased my foot off the accelerator. I pressed the clutch down and held it there. I found the gear lever and pulled it ba straight back from first into second. I released the clutch and pressed on the accelerator. The little car leaped forward as though it had been stung. We were in second gear. What speed were we going? I glanced at the speedometer. It was lit up very faintly, but I was able to read it. It said 15 miles an hour. Good. That was quite fast enough. I would stay in second gear. I started figuring out how long it would take me to do six miles traveling at 15 miles an hour. At 60 miles an hour, six miles would take six minutes. At 30, mi at 30, it would take twice as long, 12 minutes. At 15, it would take twice as long again, 24 minutes. I kept going. I knew every bit of the road, every curve, and every little rise and dip. 
Once the fox flashed out of the hedge in front of me and ran across the road with this long bushy tail streaming out behind him. I saw him clearly in the glow of my headlamps. His fur was red brown and he had a white muzzle. It was a thrilling sight. I began to worry about the motor. I knew very well it would be certain to overheat if I drove for very if I drove for long in either first or second gear. I was in second. I must now change up into third. I took a deep breath and grasped the gear lever again. Foot off the accelerator, clutch in, gear lever up and across and up again, clutch out. I'd done it. I pressed down on the accelerator. The speedometer crept up to 30. I gripped the wheel very tight with both hands and stayed in the middle of the road. At this rate, I would, be, I would soon be there. Hazel Wood was not on the main road. To reach it, you had to turn left through the, a gap in the hedge and go up, uphill over a bumpy track for about a quarter of a mile. If the ground had been wet, there would have been no hope of getting there in a car. But there hadn't been any rain for a week, and the ground would surely be hard and dry. I figured I must be get, getting pretty close to turning place now. I must watch out for it carefully. It would be easy to miss to miss it. There was no gate or anything else to indicate where it was. It was simply a small gap in the hedge, just wide enough to allow farm tractors to go through. Suddenly, far ahead of me, just below the rim of the night sky, I saw a splash of yellow light. I watched it trembling. There was something I had been dreading all along. Very quickly, the light got brighter and brighter and nearer and nearer, and in a few seconds, it took shape and became the long white beam of headlamps from a car rushing towards me. My turning place must be very close now. I was desperate to reach it and swing off the road before the monster reached me. I pressed my foot hard down for one for more speed. The little engine roared. The speedometer needle went from 30 to 35 and then to 40, but the other car was closing fast. Its headlight headlamps were like two dazzling white eyes. They grew bigger and bigger and suddenly the whole road in front of me was lit up as clear as daylight and swish the thing went past me like a bullet it was so close i felt the wind of it through my open window and in that tiny fraction of a second when the two of us were alongside one another i caught a glimpse of its white painted body and i knew it was the police i didn't dare look around to see if they were stopping and coming back after me i was certain they would stop any policeman in their world would stop if he suddenly passed a small boy in a tiny car chugging along a lonely road at half past two in the morning. My only thought was to get away to uh, was to get away to to escape to vanish. Though heaven knows why knows how I was going to do that. I pressed my foot harder still on the accelerator. Then all at once I saw in my own dim headlamps the tiny gap in the hedge. On my left hand side there wasn't time to break or slow down so i just yanked the wheel hard over and prayed the little car swerved violently off the road leaped through the gap hit the rising ground bounced high in the air then skidded around sideways behind the hedge and stopped the first thing i did was to switch off all my lights i am quite sure what made me do this except that I knew I must hide, and I knew that if you are hiding from someone in the dark, you don't shine lights all over the place to show where you are. I sat very still in my dark car. The hedge was thick, was a thick one, and I couldn't see through it. The car had bounced and skidded sideways in such a way that it was now right off the track. It was behind the hedge and in a sort of a field. It was facing back towards the filling station, tucked in very close to the hedge. I could hear the police car. It had pulled about it had pulled up about fifty yards down the road, and now it was backing and turning. The road was far too narrow for it to turn around in one go. Then the roar from the motor got louder, and he came back fast with engine revving and head headlamps blazing. He flashed past the place where I was hiding and raced away into the night. That meant the policeman had not seen me swing her off the road but he was certain to come back again looking for me, and if he came back slowly enough, he would probably see the gap. He would stop and get out of his car. He would walk through the gap and look behind the hedge, and then, then his torch would shine in my face, and he would say, What's going on, Sonny? What's the big idea? 
Where do you think you're going? Whose car is this? Where do you live? Where are your parents? He would make me go with him to the police station. And in the end, they would get the whole story out of me and my father would be ruined. I sat quiet as a mouse and waited. I waited for a long time. Then I heard the sound of, a, of the motor coming back again in my direction. It was making a terrible noise. He was going flat out. He whizzed past me like a rocket. The way he was gunning that motor told me he was a very angry man. He must have been a very puzzled man too. Perhaps he was thinking he had seen a ghost, a ghost boy driving a ghost car. I waited to see if he, if he would come back again. He didn't come. I switched on my lights. I pressed the starter. She started at once. But what about the wheels and the chassis? I felt sure something must have got broken when she jumped off the road onto the cart track. I put her into gear and very gently began to ease forward. I listened carefully for horrid noises. There were none. I managed to get her off the grass and back onto the track. I do drove very slowly now. The track was extremely rough and rutted and the rope was pretty steep. The little car bounced and bumped all over the place, but she kept going. Then at last, ahead of me and over to the right, looking like some gigantic black creature crouching on the crest of the hill, I saw Hazel Wood. Hazel's Wood. Soon I was there. Immense trees rose up towards the sky all along the right-hand side of the track. I stopped the car. I switched off the motor and the lights. I got out, taking the torch with me. There was the usual hedge dividing the wood from the track. I squeezed my way through it and suddenly it was right inside the wood. When I looked up, the trees had closed in above my head like a prison roof and I couldn't see the smallest patch of sky or a single star. I couldn't see anything at all. The darkness was so solid around me, I could almost touch it. Dad, I called out, Dad, are you there? My small voice echoed through the forest and faded away. I listened for an answer but none came.